Hi guys, this is your old preacher Hambone, and I'm going to pretend like it is Sunday, March 1st, 2015, here in Doomsday Eco Lodge in St. Croix Virgin Islands, because uh, I'm going to be busy with some strong southern women all day on Sunday tomorrow, so anyway, I'm going to bring you my Doomsday Sermon of the Week. Uh, and this week's Bible of the Apocalypse, what I'm going to do, kind of like I did with On the Road a couple of weeks ago, I am going to revisit Herman Hesse's classic little novel, Siddhartha, uh, in this reading. The last time I read this book, I was 16 years old, hitchhiking with my dog, uh, around the United States figuring out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And now I am a 55-year-old man still trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, but I know what I'm not going to do with it, and that is to return to my life as a $100,000 a year real estate agent and house flipper working for Keller Williams Real Estate in Austin, Texas. Whoa, I'm about to, my doomsday pulpit is about to flip over on me. So I'm going to flip ahead and read the chapter called Samsara. At this point, we find our, our protagonist, Siddhartha. Uh, he is now in middle age, having a middle age crisis, reviewing his life. So anyway, so this guy has tried all of these different paths in life. So this is, he is now a successful businessman living in this nice home, uh, you know, living the party lifestyle, making money, uh, just, just living the good life. And he wakes up one day and realizes that he is not happy. And what does Siddhartha, so this is kind of about two-thirds of the way through the book. So uh, I could certainly relate to this chapter as a 55-year-old wandering doomsday tourist. Take it away, Herman Hesse. <clears throat> For a long time, Siddhartha had lived the life of the world without belonging to it. His senses, which he had deadened during, during his ardent Samana years, were again awakened. He had tasted riches, passion, and power, but for a long time he remained a Samana in his heart. A Samana is basically a a pilgrim traveling around uh, without money. Clever Kamala had recognized this, Kamala being his sort of his girlfriend. Clever Kamala had recognized this. His life was always directed by the art of thinking, waiting, and fasting. The people of the world the ordinary people were still alien to him, just as he was apart from them. The years passed by, enveloped by comfortable circumstances. Siddhartha hardly noticed their passing. He had become rich. He had long possessed a house of his own and his own servants and a garden at the outskirts of the town by the river. Reminding me of my own home, Frog Hollow. People liked him. They came to him if they wanted money or advice. However, with the exception of Kamala, he had no close friends. That glorious, exalted awakening which he had once experienced in his youth that alert expectation, that pride of standing alone without teachers and doctrines, 
that eager readiness to hear the divine voice within his own heart had gradually become a memory, had passed the only fountainhead which had once been near and which had once sung loudly within him, now murmured softly in the distance. However, many things which he had learned from the Samanas and, and from his youth uh, still retained for a long time a moderate life. Pleasure in thinking, hours of meditation, secret knowledge of the self, of the eternal self, that was neither body nor consciousness. Many of these he had retained, others were submerged and covered with dust, just as the potter's wheel, once set in motion, still turns for a long time and then turns only very slowly and stops, so too did the wheel of the ascetic, the wheel of thinking, the wheel of, of discrimination still revolve for a long time in Siddhartha's soul. It still revolved, but slowly and hesitatingly, and it had nearly come to a standstill. Slowly, like moisture entering the dying tree trunk, slowly filling and rotting it, so did the world and inertia creep into Siddhartha's soul. It slowly filled his soul, made it heavy, made it tired, sent it to sleep. But on the other hand, his senses became more awakened. They learned a great deal, experienced a great deal. Siddhartha had learned how to transact business affairs, to exercise power over people, to amuse himself with women. He had learned to wear fine clothes, to command servants, to bathe in sweet-smelling waters. He had learned to eat sweet and carefully prepared foods, fish, meat and fowl, spices, spices and dainties, and to drink wine, which made him lazy and forgetful. He had learned to play dice and chess, <coughs> to watch dancers, to be carried in sedan chairs, to sleep on a soft bed. But he had always felt different from and superior to the others. He had always watched them a little scornfully with a slightly mocking disdain, with that disdain which a Samana always feels toward the people of the world. If Kama Swami, that was his boss, kind of a, a real estate broker to a real estate uh, agent in, in, in essence, if Kama Swami was upset with him, if he felt that he had been insulted or if he was troubled with his business affairs, Siddhartha had always regarded him mockingly, but slowly and imperceptibly with the passing of the seasons, his mockery and feeling of superiority diminished. Gradually, along with his growing riches, Siddhartha himself acquired some of the characteristics of the ordinary people some of their childishness and some of their anxiety. And yet, he envied them. The more he became like them, the more he envied them. 
he envied them the one thing that he lacked and they had that sense of importance with which they lived their lives, the depth of their pleasure and sorrows, the anxious but sweet happiness of their continual power to love. These people were always in love with themselves, with their children, with honor or money, with their plans or hope. But these he did not learn from them, these childlike pleasures and follies. He only learned the unpleasant things from them, which he despised. It happened more and more frequently that after a merry evening, he lay late in bed the following morning and felt dull and tired. He would become annoyed and impatient when his boss bored him with his worries. He would laugh too loudly when he lost at dice. His face was still more clever and intellectual than other people's, but he rarely laughed and gradually his face assumed the expressions which are so often found among rich people. The expressions of discontent, of sickliness, of displeasure, of idleness, of, lovely, of lovelessness. Slowly, the soul sickness of the rich crept over Siddhartha. <clears throat> like a veil, like a thin mist, a weariness settled on Siddhartha. Slowly, every day a little thicker, every month a little darker, every year a little heavier. As a new dress grows old with time, loses its bright color, becomes stained and creased, the hems frayed, and here and there weak and threadbare places, so had Siddhartha's new life, which he had begun, become old. In the same way, it lost its color and sheen with the passing of the years, creases and stains accumulated and hidden in the depths here and there already appearing weighted disillusionment and nausea. Siddhartha did not notice it. He only noticed that the bright and clear inward voice that had once awakened in him and had always guided him in his finest hours had become silent. The world had caught him. Pleasure, covetousness, idle, idleness, and finally also that vice that he had always despised and scorned as the most foolish of all. Acquisitiveness property, possessions, and riches had finally trapped him. They were no longer a game and a toy. They had become a chain and a burden. Siddhartha wandered along a strange, twisted path of this last and most base declivity through the game of dice. Since the time he had stopped being a Samana, a pilgrim in his heart, Siddhartha began to play dice for money and jewels with increasing fervor, fervor a game in which he had previously smilingly and indulgently taking part as a custom of the ordinary people. 
Okay, then he goes on about how he gets more and more ruthless uh, in his dice game. In no other way could he show more clearly and mockingly his contempt for riches, the false deity of the businessman. Anyway, he, he keeps going uh, with this dice analogy. This dice analogy was, was reminding me of, of my real estate contract analogy. You know, this, this how I used to feel when, when I would put thousands of dollars on the line to, to buy another house in, in my instance. I mean, it was a rush, guys, to, uh, to, to roll the dice on thousands of dollars. This goddamn, I, I mean, it was, I know exactly what Hesse is talking about here. This roll of the dice and how it gives real estate agents a hard on uh, in, in, in a sense. He loved this feeling and continually sought to renew it, to increase it, to stimulate it. For in this feeling alone did he experience some kind of happiness, some kind of excitement in his life some heightened living in the midst of his satiated, tepid, insipid existence. And after every great loss, he devoted himself to the procurement of new riches, went eagerly after business, and pressed his debtors for payment for he wanted to play again. He wanted to squander again. He wanted to show his contempt for riches again. Siddhartha became impatient at his losses. He lost his patience with slow paying debtors. He was no longer kind hearted to beggars. He no longer had the desire to gifts to give gifts and loans to the poor. He, who staked 10,000 on the throw of the dice and laughed, became more hard and mean in business and sometimes dreamt of money at night. And whenever he awakened from this hateful spell, when he saw his face reflected in the mirror on the wall of his bedroom, growing older and uglier whenever shame and nausea overtook him. He fled again, fled to a new game of chance, bought another house to flip, fled in confusion to passion, to wine, and from there back again to the urge for acquiring and hoarding more wealth. He wore himself out in this senseless cycle, became old and sick. I think they're talking about the decade of his 40s. Uh, then he talks about this dream that he had okay yeah here, here we here we go siddhartha himself who was only in his 40s had noticed gray hairs hmm. had noticed gray hairs here and there weariness was written on his girlfriend's beautiful face weariness from continuing along a long path which had no joyous goal, weariness and incipient old age and concealed and not yet mentioned, perhaps not yet conscious fear, fear of the autumn of life, fear of old age, fear of death. Sighing, 
he took leave of her, his heart full of misery and secret fear. Uh, then Siddhartha had spent the night at his house with dancers and wine, had pretended to be superior to his companions, which he no longer was. <clears throat> he had drunk much wine, and late after midnight he went to bed, tired and yet agitated, nearly in tears in despair. In vain did he try to sleep. His heart was so full of misery, he felt he could no longer endure it. He was full of a nausea which overpowered him like a distasteful wine or music that was too sweet and superficial or like the too sweet smile of the dancers or the too sweet perfume of, the, of their hair and breasts. But above all, he was nauseated with himself with his perfumed hair, with the smell of wine from his mouth, with the soft, flabby appearance of his skin, like one who has eaten and drunk too much and vomits painfully and then feels better, so did the restless man wish he could rid himself with one terrific heave of these pleasures, of these habits, of this entirely senseless life. And he goes in to another dream. He, you know, he does all of the, 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 the Hesse is, is big on dream analogy. Anyway, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go to this, through this dream awakening from this dream he was overwhelmed by a feeling of great sadness it seemed to him that he had spent his life in a worthless and senseless manner he retained nothing vital nothing in any way precious or worthwhile he stood alone like a shipwrecked man on the shore and so off he goes to sit under a mango tree and felt horror and death in his heart he sat under the mango tree and felt himself dying withering finishing Gradually, he collected his thoughts and mentally went through the whole of his life. <clears throat> From the earliest days which he could remember, when had he really been happy? When had he really experienced joy? Well, he had experienced it several times. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go through this because I know I'm probably getting to 30 minutes. And so he goes, he reviews his life and then felt in his heart, a path lies before you which you are called to follow. The gods await you. And then he keeps reviewing his life. Uh, it, so it goes through pretty much just uh, reviewing the book up uh, up to this time. Uh, let's uh, let's see. So then he then he then he reaches his present life when he met his girlfriend Kamala and his boss Kama Swami. <clears throat> this whole world of the Kama Swami people had only been a game to him, a dance, a comedy which one watches. Only Kamala had been dear to him. But was she still, did he still need her? Meaning, did he still need sex? And did she still need him 
were they not playing a game without an end? Was it necessary to live for it? No. This game was called Samsara, a game for children, a game which was perhaps enjoyable played once, twice, ten times, but was it worth playing continually? Then Siddhartha knew the game was finished, that he could play it no longer. A shudder passed through his body. He felt if something had died. He sat all that day under the mango tree, th thinking all of, all of these thoughts. Had he left all of his former life in order to become a new Kama Swami? He sat there till night fell. When he looked up and saw the stars, he thought, I am sitting here under my mango tree in my pleasure garden. He smiled a little. Was it necessary? Was it right? Was it not a foolish thing that he should possess a mango tree and a pleasure garden. He had finished with all that. That also died in him. He rose, said farewell to his mango tree and the pleasure garden. As he had not had any food that day, he felt extremely hungry and thought of his house in town, of his room in bed, of the table with food. He smiled wearily, shook his head, and said goodbye to these things. The same night, Siddhartha left his garden in the town and never returned again. And there you go. Of course, uh, that chapter, Samsara, meant absolutely nothing to some 16-year-old kid starting out his life's path. And here I am, 39 years later, and I have traded in my four-bedroom, three-bath home with the pleasure garden and my games of dice. So at age 55, 39 years after reading this book, this is my new home. There you go. This is your old doomsday tourist, his new home. At least for the past two months and I've got to say I am a hell of a lot happier right here than I was in my four bedroom three bath house anyway uh, I've got to go meet a real estate agent so I better wrap up this week's Doomsday Sermon. Amen, Brother Herman Hesse. Bye, guys. Another day in paradise.